Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and today we are talking about this beast right here, and that is the Denifrips Pontus II DAC, specifically with the 12th anniversary FPGA firmware update. Okay, let's unpack that name right there. So the Pontus II is kind of parked in Denifrips, right in the middle of Denifrips line of DACs. Comes in right around 1800 US dollars. The current version that if you go to vinshine.com, which is the uh, hosting website and parent company of Den Denifrips, and you order the Pontus II there, you're gonna see that the version that is available is specifically called the 12th anniversary edition of this, okay? Denifrips is rolling out 12th anniversary editions of I think most of their product line here. This unit is not the hardware version of the 12th anniversary edition of the Pontus II, but I did do the upgraded firmware for it to the 12th anniversary edition. And I got to listen to it both before and after doing that firmware update. So this review is gonna be framed more towards the, if you already have one of the older Pontus II units, or you're able to pick one up, you know, at a discounted rate, brand new from a retailer trying to empty their stock of the older unit. Is it worth it to do that 12th anniversary edition FPGA chip firmware update? Okay, that'll be the focus of this review. So. We will go ahead and do shameless self-promotion, and then we will be right back on the other side to dig into the review of the Denifrips Pontus II DAC with the firmware update. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button, and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis, and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits, in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. The Pontus II, again, brand new, retails for in the neighborhood of about 1,800 US dollars. Varies a little bit with exchange rates and all of that because Denifrip sells from Singapore. And uh, so the, the, the exchange rates for different currencies can fluctuate that a little bit, but it's around 1,800 US dollars. Okay, just kind of ballpark where we are on the price scale of this thing here. It is a fully balanced resistor ladder or R2R DAC. Okay? It can support up to 1536 kilohertz sampling rate, 32-bit PCM files, and DSD 1024 from certain inputs. More on that in just a moment. The story about the firmware update here is that with Denifrips rolling out the updated versions of a lot of their line, Okay, the, their newer units have new firmware in them, specifically on the FPGA chip. Now, the FPGA chip is a stage of the DAC that's happening before the R2R stuff that is controlling a lot of the things, like what's fed to the resistor ladder. Okay, it just, it, it's kind of almost like my understanding anyways is kind of in the brain of how the DAC operates. Now, that may not be the most accurate statement in the world, but it's a vitally important step in the signal processing that goes on in here. So I think Alvin Chi, the uh, owner and founder of Denifrips there, he did a really cool thing where he works really hard to make sure that his older DAC units with FPGA chips in them could be updated to the same firmware. That's my understanding anyway. That's the same firmware that is in the newer 12th anniversary edition of their DACs that are rolling out. Okay, to do the update, Okay, I will put a link um, down below in the description where you can get Alvin's instructions on how to do it and like where to go to do all of that. And I will just say that um, in talking with Alvin, he's been a real joy to uh, talk to. He's been very forthcoming um, and, and prompt in answering all of my questions and all of that. He was pretty helpful about doing the firmware update and all of that. And so when you get his instructions on how to do the firmware update, Okay, mine, this update here went off without a hitch, which is good because this is a good to, um, time to say that this unit was a loan from a friend of the channel 
and he either will be taking it back here very soon or he will uh, sell it to another party there. And so it was a really cool opportunity to hear one of these older units both before and after doing that FPGA update. Now, I should say there is a very small risk of bricking the deck when you do the FPGA up update. Um, I Alvin says in one of his videos where he explains this, that it was like, you know, maybe a, a less than 1%, okay, I think significantly less than 1% of units would experience that kind of thing. It's not the end of the world, though. T contact Alvin if you have that problem, and he'll work with you. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a, a brief intro as to what this DAC is. Okay, um, and also like what this uh, firmware update is all about. So what we will do next is I will change camera vantage points here where I will do a quick unit tour of this thing. It's heavy, so I'm not going to hold it up here the whole time and then we'll come back on the other side of that. And we will dig into the ins and the outs before and after the, uh, the ins and outs of the sound, I should say, before and after doing that firmware update. All right, here we go. Quick unit tour, we see the front panel here and the most notable thing about the build right off the bat is that this thing is a tank. Like it's got very solidly built and thick, like aluminum plating basically all the way around it. Okay, it is heavy, it is large, it is heavy. Again, built like a tank. Okay, front panel right here. What we see right here is we've got all of the different input options. I will show you on the back panel all of those in just a moment. There is a tiny LED light that glows red when you select that button there up top. Over here we have the sampling rate key that comes in. So you've got two like fundamental sampling rates here, 44.1 kilohertz. 48 kilohertz. So if you're listening to like a red book, 16 bit, 44.1 kilohertz file, the 44 one, uh, the 44 K one button or indicator right here will have a small led on it. Okay. If you happen to be listening to an 88.2 kilohertz file, then this will light up as like the fundamental frequency, so to speak, fundamental frequency. And then the two X multiplier will light up. So that would mean 44 times two, 88 kilohertz. Similarly, with 48 kilohertz, if it's just that, that and that will glow together. If it's a 96 kilohertz file, this and this will have LEDs above them. Okay, buttons down here. Not direct input selection, but we have input minus and input plus. So if you're on this input and you want to move over here, hit that. If you're on this input, you want to move over here, hit that. The one thing that it does not do is cycle back around. So if you get to the end, you got to go back, okay? Either direction. All right, you can flip the phase on this if you want. Here is the Osnos button. So this does have a non oversampling mode in it, as well as an oversampling with digital filters. Hit that to cycle between the two. Here's a mute button that also acts as a, hey, I want to change some settings button. All right, so you hit mute and then you can hit some of these other buttons here to cycle things through like the different I squared S configurations and uh, whether you're going to toggle between using the two AES inputs individually or run a dual AES, that sort of thing. Okay, then the mode button here doesn't do much else other than help toggle between some of the options that you get to by hitting the mute button. All right, so that is the front panel. Let me pause this and turn the unit around and we will look at the derriere. Okay, back panel. Okay, standard looking power input. It can accept Basically, any voltage input that you find around the world here. I don't see any switches. I think it's just a good design and that it reacts to whatever is coming in. All right, here are the outputs. You see balanced XLR, single-ended RCA. It says very clearly in the owner's manual, you do not want to use these simultaneously. Pick either balanced or single-ended, but don't do both. My listening tests bear this out. So more on the sonic impacts of running those two simultaneously in the sound section. But it comes down to that there are no output buffers here, that both of these outputs are tapped directly into the R2R uh, resistor ladder in there. And so it's kind of a purist approach, you know, less stuff in the signal chain kind of a, a, a design here. But again, you have to pick 
which you're going to use. So again, more on the sonic uh, outcomes of that in the sound section. Okay, a bunch of different inputs actually here. We have coaxial SPDIF in two flavors, RCA connector and BNC connector. We have two AES, okay, balanced XLR three pin SPDIF inputs that can run in two modes. You can use them individually and just use two single cable AES sources if you want, or you can do some toggling on the front and run these in dual AES mode if you have a source that will do that. There are not too many of those out there, but if you have one, that could be handy. Okay, Toslink optical SPDIF input, I2S input, which uses an HDMI cable and connector, and then the USB input. Now, this DAC from the USB and the I2S will accept PCM signals up to 32-bit 1536 kilohertz. Okay, they will also accept DSD up to DSD 1024. The rest of the inputs top out at 24-bit 192 kilohertz PCM files. Okay, I think that's what we need to talk about for front and back panels. Let's get into things like test gear and sound. All right, let's uh, talk about the sound here. And to do that, we're gonna do it in a little bit more narrative form here, because again, we have a before and after of this uh, firmware update to discuss here. So when I first received this, uh, I plugged it into my system and it was fed at first by the iFi Neo Stream, um, which I did a review for recently and we'll put a link to down below. Uh, feeding the, I think either the I squared S, yeah, it was I squared S input for a while and um, maybe the coax input in there too. And uh, just used it that way again before the firmware update. And uh, notice that the sound was very, or I, and then from there, the balanced output mostly was my listening there um, into my Vioelectric HPA V281, which I just made a video about recently and I can link to that too. Okay, with a variety of headphones. Sosvaro was in there, HE1000SE, original Utopia, uh, a bunch of things, but you know, those three heavy hitters in there to really give me an idea of what this thing is doing. Okay, we're used uh, fairly frequently. All right, and what I noticed about the sound is like the, the descriptions you hear around the review sphere about the Pontus II are pretty accurate, right? It's, it was a very warm signature from a uh, frequency response, like a perceived frequency response kind of thing. I am very confident it will measure pretty much flat from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz in actual frequency response, but it has some added mid-bass presence and maybe a little bit rolled off treble too, at least perceptively, that really gave, gave it a warm sound to its perceived frequency response, okay, it perceived signature. It also had a very expansive sound stage with pretty good imaging and separation, fairly holographic, especially for the price point there. And it has, especially in its NAS or non-oversampling mode, it has a, a, you know, a, kind of a lively energetic sound. So it's fun, not necessarily from a frequency response standpoint, like being V-shaped as you commonly hear, fun, Okay, but it's uh, fun from just like an activity and liveliness kind of presentation to it, uh, to go with it. Now, pre-firmware update, I did not think it was the greatest match to my V281 amp. And I tried it a little bit on the iFi Pro iCAN Signature Edition that I still have in and I'm still working on a review for. Okay, um, that... The Pro Icon is a little bit brighter signature, and it's a little, it's, it's a very fast and upfront kind of amplifier. Like it, it, it damps the decays quite a bit, which made it a better match, I think, to the, the Pontus II. Now, I did miss the resolution that the uh, V281 was giving me, even with the, the Pontus II, over the Pro Icon, but um, sound signature-wise from a frequency response and presentation sound standpoint, that was a better match. All right, so I've had a ton of DACs in lately, so I didn't do a, a whole lot more listening to that. Like, I didn't check all of the quality of the inputs and the outputs and all of that because uh, the Pontus II also has a reputation for sounding its best when paired, to, paired with a good DDC and using the I-squared-S input on it. 
um, and being not so great from the USB input or the SPDIF inputs. Okay, or at least not nearly as strong as it is from the I squared S from a, a good DDC. I didn't have a chance to check all of that beforehand just because I had so many other things going on. But um, after the update, I did get a chance to check on all of those things. So most of what I'm going to say here from this point forward is going to be about the sound and the usability of the Pontus 2 with that 12th anniversary edition FPGA firmware update. Okay, so let's dig into that. Test gear uh, is still mostly similar. I did swap and use both my uh, Singer SU2 DDC to feed this thing through both uh, I AES, uh, coax, and I think I squared S made it in there too. And then I did a lot of my critical listening using Denifrips's matching Iris DDC uh, via I squared S into this. And the, the Iris DDC is also going to get a review here very soon. And then like, again, for critical listening there, uh, I would mostly use the HP AV281 uh, and then uh, the Hi Feynman Susvara, Hi Feynman HE1000SE, and the original Focal Utopia would have been the headphones that I most used for the critical listening aspects of this. All right, long list of things to get here too, so use the, the, the timestamps to move around as you need to. Okay. So as I mentioned, it, it just real quick again, so before the firmware update, a very warm perceptive frequency response, expansive sound, sound stage, a lot of smoothness and relaxedness to it, not particularly resolving, but not necessarily lacking in detail retrieval either. And it still had a fairly you know, fun, energetic kind of presentation. After the firmware update, the perceived frequency response moves much closer to neutral. It's not full on like dead neutral. There's still a little bit of warmth to it with just a little bit of emphasis still in the mid base region and maybe a slightly rolled off top end still. Okay, but so call it more neutral warm as opposed to just warm. The sound stage still remains expansive and fairly accurate in terms of its imaging and its separation and there and the positional effects and that sort of thing. It still maintains that energetic and lively uh, a presentation to it, particularly with NAS mode enabled, non-oversampling, which I will say right now, I did most of my um, listening in NAS mode, and I will explain why when we get to NAS versus Oz here very shortly. Okay, but still has that energetic, fun, lively presentation from just like a an active, energetic kind of of listening and presentation there. And then the biggest change, I think, well the two biggest changes, one being that change in signature. The other one is that there is more resolution, more detail retrieval coming out of this now with the firmware update. Okay, so more texturing in the bass, more clearly refined and defined room reverbs and vocal reverbs and things like that. Okay, more zizziness, okay, uh, th that sound of a bow being dragged across a string, more of that comes out and all that. Now, it's still a more relaxed detail presentation than other DACs, but there's just is a more, it's, it's more detail forward than before the firmware update. And there is just more in the signal to begin with, like just the detail comes out more. But I would still say that on balance, it still tends towards being a slightly more relaxed detail presentation compared to some of the competition, which we'll also get to a little bit in a moment. Okay, now that signature change and that detail retrieval change is where anyone considering this update is going to have to be the most careful from a sonic standpoint, I think. Um, if you remember my review of the Shit by Frost 2 slash 64, which I can put a link to down below, there was a similar story there where the OG Bifrost 2 was a very like warm and, and just had a very unique sonic character to it, which matched well and synergized well with some systems, right? and not as well with some others. And then the 2 slash 6 4 version came along and the signature tore, you know, brought it back closer to neutral, had a more neutral presentation and more detail retrieval in it and slightly more treble presence and all that. So we had a similar 
nature change in sound signature there, and we had a similar nature change in the resolution and detail retrieval presentations. And we get a similar effect here going on, where if you built your system, you carefully built your system around the fact that the Pontus II was a warm, wide, smooth DAC, okay, that had good but not stellar resolution and detail retrieval on it, and then you do this firmware update, this new sound may not gel as well with your system as the old version did. So that's the biggest word of caution that I will give someone considering this, this update because the, the signature definitely changes and the detail retrieval and resolution definitely improves and comes forward just a little bit. Okay, so again, it's, it's going to be a synergy thing for your system and what your preferences are as to whether that's desirable and will work in your system. But that's the biggest word of caution that I would give anyone who already has one of these and has carefully built their system around the original sound. Okay, now let's start going down the list here of like how this thing does um, compared to itself on a lot of things. Like for example, non-oversampling versus oversampling. If you keep it in oversampling mode, there are a number of digital filters that can have a mild impact on the sound, but generally I just straight up preferred non-oversampling on this particular deck. Um, that was true back when I reviewed the Ares 2 a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago. Okay, um, it, I'm finding that to be true again at least so far, it could change on the Aries 12th anniversary edition, which Alvin sent me to review. Okay, um, that sort of thing. I just think I think Alvin and Denifrips they just they do a good job with their non-oversampling modes here. And the reason that I preferred the NAS mode was because to me the oversampling just sounded slightly softer and it didn't have the same energy to the presentation. Um, that the non-oversampling did. And when I say softer, it just it wasn't quite as re resolving and it just wasn't as clearly separated out. Um, and so it just sounded a little bit more blended, slurred together kind of thing. Not terrible, not a huge difference. I will say the magnitude of the change is smaller than I remember it being on the Aries 2 from two and a half years ago, because that was a big change to my recollection. This isn't a huge change, but it is detectable. The other thing that I noticed going from oversampling to non-oversampling is that the non-oversampling filled in left center and left right just a little bit and it also like lifted the vertical position of the center image just a little bit. So if there was a, a, a vocalist sitting in the center image and it was in oversampling mode and then I switched it to NAS mode, if the vocalist was like right here, then in NAS it would be right here. Don't know why that happened. It was just a thing that I noticed. Okay, it's neither good nor bad. It just is. Okay, um, let's talk about inputs. All that. Oh, I should say. So anyway, I did most of my critical listening and comparisons and all of that uh, on everything else in NAS mode, just because I liked it better and thought that's where this DAC sounded its best. Okay, moving on. The input, so I checked several of them. After the update, it was really, really difficult to pick out any meaningful difference in sonic performance between the I squared S input and the AES inputs using either the Iris DDC or the Singer SU2 DDC. Okay, so at least the AES inputs, from my understanding anyway, with the new firmware update have improved in their overall performance relative to pre-update and are now very, very close, if not basically just dead even with the I squared S inputs. And unfortunately, like because they are just different connector and cable types, I cannot get identical I squared S and AES cables to do a quick swap back and forth. But I can tell you that with the, I tried a variety of different, both generic and like, you know, Audio Quest Cinnamon and you know, all those kind of, kind of um, cables and all of that um, on each. And I honestly think that between I squared S and AES, I was mostly just hearing the difference in the cables rather than any meaningful difference in the connection. Now, if you want to pass DSD or really high sampling rate PCM files, um, into the 
into the Pontus II, you're still going to need to use the I squared S input. Okay, but if it we're talking PCM files up to 24 bit 192 kilohertz, I just really think there's almost no meaningful difference anymore between the quality of the input of I2S and AES, assuming they're both coming from a quality source like a DDC or a quality streamer or something like that. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, the USB implementation does not improve a whole lot, at least relative to the performance of the, the AES and the I squared S input. So the USB sound of this, even when I fed it as clean a signal as I could get from like my uh, Microsoft Surface Pro 4 tablet slash laptop running off of just battery power, like it just, it, it was kind of almost like the Oz versus Nas stuff again, where it's just another layer of just a little bit of softness, takes out some of the liveliness using the the in, um, the included USB implementation, okay, uh, input and all of that, and just wasn't as well separated spatially. It's not terrible, it just definitely is not where this DAC performs its best. Likewise with the coaxial SPDIF inputs, um, I found that those still are a step behind the I squared S and the AES. And again, similar kind of, of sound there where it's just a little bit softer, not as well separated out, just not quite as resolving, not as holographic, not quite as energetic, lively kind of sound going on there too. So my understanding is that at least the AES input quality improves coming um, post firmware update. Uh, so that's good. I still think that you're going to want to use an external uh, DDC or streamer if you want to use a, a USB connection. We'll use a, US, um, a DDC to go USB to whatever you're gonna, your source is and then use the I squared S or the AES to go into the Pontus 2 or get a streamer that has a quality AES or I squared S input on it, output on it already. Okay. I mentioned balance versus single-ended performance already. I will come back to that. Again, the, the owner's manual says don't run the XLR balanced and the R RCA unbalanced outputs connected at the same time. Pick one or the other. Many DACs have a very noticeable improvement different or sonic uh, difference between them, between their balanced and single-ended outputs, particularly around this price and cheaper. I honestly did not hear a huge difference between balanced and single-ended output. There is a difference. This is not a huge one. The balanced output, analog output, is better, I'm pretty sure. Now, the tricky part here is to really test their ultimate performance. I didn't plug them both in at the same time. Okay, I had the balance plugged in, and then I'd have to walk around behind my desk, unplug the balance cables, plug the, the RCA cables in, and then go back and restart the same song and all that. So it was not nearly as fast an A-B check, but I did think pretty consistently I, felt, I heard just a, a hint of better, like, again, separation, a little bit better smoothness, a little bit more refinement, a little bit uh, more accurate imaging separation, you know, and a little bit more lively, again, kind of presentation coming from the balanced output as opposed to the single-ended. Again, with the slow switch physically, you know, swap out cables method, okay? Um, and because it is a fully balanced DAC, like, you know, there's... I'm not exactly sure which way Alvin went if he only used half of the R2R ladder, meaning one channel to get it to the RCA outputs, or if he's doing some kind of internal kajiggering. Either way, my guess is he's using half because there's no output buffer, okay? Either way, you're paying for a balanced DAC and not using it balanced if you use the RCA outputs. And so since the XLR outputs are a little bit better and it's, you know, arguably only using half the DAC if you use a single-ended output, just plan to use this in a balanced system. All right, because I was just super curious, I did run both the XLR and the RCA analog outputs plugged in together, and I did notice that the whole unit from both outputs takes a sonic hit in so doing. And again, it's not an a huge difference, but it is detectable and definitely keeps the DAC below its own performance ceiling. 
The biggest change here that I noticed would be the, the dynamics and the act activity level. Like it's just that liveliness, the energeticness that is just part of this DAX character uh, is a little bit squelched. Okay, it doesn't hit as hard. It's not as like physically fun kind of a thing or energetically fun after that. So that to me was the biggest difference that I noticed there doing that. I didn't notice like a ton of resolution changes or anything like that. It just gets a little bit flatter, duller, more boring sounding when you use both outputs simultaneously. So a little bit of editorialization here. It's really up to you, the end user, as to whether or not that matters. I can see it going both ways. At $1,800, you might be starting to get into the price territory where it's like, okay, we want, we need fewer features and more specialization and thus better performance. So that's okay. Or it's $1,800, I expect to be able to use both outputs and get a high quality experience from both. You're both right. <laughs> Okay, it's just going to come down to um, what your needs and your preferences are. So if you're looking for, you know, an around $2,000 DAC that can be your do-it-all device and you want to run balanced outputs to your, you know, high-performance solid-state amplifier and you want to run the single-ended outputs to your high-performance tube amp, Okay, um, it's just not, this DAC is not going to be the option for you there because it takes a, a sonic hit if you want to do that, unless you're willing to swap, physically swap the cables out every time you want to use a different amp. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. All right, um, let's do a quick comparison then to another DAC in the price range. And I'm and just because it's what I have on hand, it's my Cord Hugo 2, which I realize people are going to look at that and say, oh, it's $2,800. I mean, the DAC section in it is arguably about a $2,000 DAC, and then you know, the extra 800 comes from the fact that it's a transportable unit. It's sort of a headphone amplifier and it's, you know, got other stuff in it like Bluetooth and that sort of thing that makes it mobile friendly. Okay. Um, but as far as pure DAC performance goes, the way I did this is I used my VIO V281. Okay. Um, and also uh, it, for both amps, I plugged the balanced, just the balance plugged in into the V281's balanced inputs. And I did the single-ended output, which is only single-ended from the Hugo 2 into my, uh, into the single-ended input of my V281 and just switched back and forth there. And it's nice because I can adjust the output level of the Hugo 2 and I could volume match that way and do a pretty quick switch here. And to me, the, the perceived frequency response presentation of the Hugo 2 is closer to true neutral. Okay. It's a, uh, it doesn't have quite that same level of mid-bass forwardness that the uh, Pontus II does, which again is still less so than it, than the Pontus II was before the FPGA firmware update. Okay, and it's um, just a little bit brighter. The Hugo II is just a little bit brighter. Okay, um, but I also noticed some spatial some sp spatial interesting things. The sound stages of the two devices, the Hugo 2 and the Pontus 2 were like stubbornly the same size. I kept switching back and forth, trying to hear the boundaries of the soundstage move, okay, with the deck, and they just didn't. It was very strange. I've never had that experience before where two DACs threw almost the identically sized soundstage, but these two did it. It was weird and it was unnerving, but it happened, okay? Um, so there's that. But that said, the way that they did it within the soundstage was a little different. The Hugo 2 was a little bit closer to me. Its center image was a little bit wider. But I think the Hugo 2 also filled out left center and left right just a little bit more accurately and fully. So it sounded just, just a little bit more coherent laterally across the soundstage. Okay. The Pontus 2, again... Um, was still just a little bit more relaxed. So if you don't like the Hugo 2's more forward presentation, there's an advantage here. Um, and it also just did, it had a little bit better bass extension and sub bass presence going on with it. The two are almost dead even on that like energetic and lively kind of presentation though, from a dynamics standpoint, okay? Um, I haven't mentioned the dynamics a lot on this just because 
like I, my personal DAX are the Hugo 2, the Berkeley Alpha Series 2, which both kind of have that same energetic and lively kind of presentation where the Pondus 2 also does that. So it like just didn't really even occur to me to make notes on that a lot of the time. All right. I do think the Hugo 2 is just slightly more resolving, just ever so slightly. Yes, it's a little brighter, and some are going to say it's just a treble, you know, just more treble. Eh, it's in the mids, too. A little bit more vocal reverb, a little bit more clear sense of uh, a sense, like time gap between when a, per, when a vocalist sings something and then the reverb happens, okay? Like, there's just a little bit better separation in there coming from the Hugo 2. Still, from the balanced output of the Pontus 2, using only the um, balanced output plugged in, NAS mode, and either the I squared S or the AES input from a good DDC. And I'm comfortable saying that the Hugo 2 and the Pontus 2 are within the category of technical equals that just sound a little bit different. And it's just going to be sonic preferences to the end users to which one they want. Okay. Um, I should say the Hugo 2 was run from the same DDC, either the, the Iris or my Singer SU2 via its coaxial input to check this too, while this one used either the AES or the I squared S from either of those. Okay, same thing at the same time. Okay, so that tells me anyway, their closeness there tells me that this Denifrips unit with the new firmware update in particular is right where it needs to be price wise right at about two thousand dollars and all of that okay it's um and even if you get it less now and do this update it could become a really good value i do expect that if there are new units out out there still sitting on shelves in store somewhere they're going to start bringing sales out to move those pick those up do the firmware update you're getting a pretty good deal at that point okay so uh i think again it was really cool of alvin uh, to offer and just go through the work of making this 12th anniversary edition uh, firmware update available to Denifrips owners already. I think that is awesome customer service and he should be commended for that. The process is not extremely arduous in getting it done. His directions and instructions on how to do it are pretty good. And I liked the results. I personally preferred the sound after the FPGA update. I like the more detail forward presentation and the you know closer to neutral uh, frequency response, perceived frequency response. It matches better with my HPA V281 with the update than it did before. It was a little bit too warm, too thick, too stuck in the mud of a combo, um, too spatially loose of a combo um, before the uh, the update, but. With my Vio after, the, the pairing sounded pretty darn good, okay? Um, so, yeah, but that may not be the case for you and your system. All right, so I will go ahead and leave it there. I am Wave Theory. These, this has been my thoughts on doing the 12th anniversary uh, firmware update for the Denifrips Pontus 2 R2R fully balanced DAC. All right, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment, check out my PayPal, my Patreon, all of those things. And as always, enjoy the music.